This excerpt is read from the essay on saying please written by the essayist Alfred George Gardiner. This excerpt is taken from the KTBS Standard 9th English First Language Textbook and it is also based on a day in the life of a bus conductor. About the essayist Alfred George Gardiner. Alfred George Gardiner, born in 1865 and died in 1946, was a British journalist and author. His essays written under the pen name Alpha of the Plough are highly regarded. He was also chairman of the National Anti-Sweating League, a pressure group which campaigned for a minimum wage in industry. I should like to feature in this connection my friend, the polite conductor. By this discriminating title, I do not intend to suggest a rebuke to conductors generally. On the contrary, I am disposed to think that there are few classes of men who come through the ordeal of a very trying calling better than bus conductors do. Here and there you will meet an unpleasant specimen who regards the passengers as his natural enemies, as creatures whose purpose on the bus is to cheat him and who can only be kept reasonably honest by a loud voice and an aggressive manner. But this type is rare, rarer than it used to be. I fancy the public owes much to the underground railway company which also runs the buses for insisting on a certain standard of civility in its servants and taking care that that standard is observed. In doing this, it is not only makes things pleasant for the traveling public, but performs an important social service. It is not, therefore, with any feeling of friendliness to conductors as a class that I pay a tribute to a particular member of that class. I first became conscious of his existence one day when I jumped onto a bus and found that I had left home without any money in my pocket. Everyone has had the experience and knows the feeling, the mixed feeling which the discovery arouses. You are annoyed because you look like a fool at the best and like a knave at the worst. You would not be at all surprised if the conductor eyed you coldly as much as to say, yes, I know that stale old trick. Now then, off you get. And even if the conductor is a good fellow and lets you down easily, you are faced with the necessity of going back and the inconvenience, perhaps, of missing your train or your engagement. Having searched my pockets in vain for stray coppers, and having found I was utterly penniless, I told the conductor with an honest face as I could assume that I couldn't pay the fare and must go back for money. Oh, you needn't get off. That's all right, said he. All right, said I, but I haven't a copper on me. Oh, I'll book you, though, he replied. Where'd he want to go? And he handled his bundle of tickets with the air of a man who was prepared to give me a ticket for anywhere from the bank to Hong Kong. I said it was very kind of him and told him where I wanted to go. And as he gave me the ticket, I said, but where shall I send the fare? Oh, you'll see me some day, all right. He said cheerfully as he turned to go. And then luckily, my fingers, still wandering in the corners of my pockets, lighted on a shilling and the account was squared. But the fact did not lessen the glow of pleasure which so good-natured an action has given me. A few days after, my more sensitive toe was trampled on rather heavily as I sat reading on the top of a bus. I looked up with some anger and more agony and saw my friend of the cheerful countenance. Sorry, sir, he said. I know these are heavy boots. Caught them because my own feet get trod on so much. And now I'm treading on other people's. Hope I didn't hurt you, sir. He had hurt me, but he was so nice about it that I assured him he hadn't. After this, I began to observe him whenever I boarded his bus and found a curious pleasure in the constant good nature of his bearing. He seemed to have an inexhaustible fund of patience and a gift for making his passengers comfortable. 
I noticed that if it was raining, he would run up the stairs to give someone the tip that there was room inside. With old people, he was as considerate as a son and with children as solicitous, solicitous as a father. He had evidently a peculiarly warm place in his heart for young people and always indulged in some merry jest with them. If he had a blind man on board, it wasn't enough to set him down safely on the pavement. He would call to Bill in front to wait while he took him across the road or round the corner or otherwise safely on his way. In short, I found that he irradiated such an atmosphere of good temper and kindliness that a journey with him was a lesson in natural courtesy and manners. What struck me particularly was the ease with which he got through his work. If bad manners are infectious, so also are good manners. If we encounter incivility, most of us are apt to become uncivil. But it is unusually an uncouth person who can be disagreeable with sunny people. It is with manners as with, with the weather. Nothing clears up my spirit like a fine day, said Keats, and a cheerful person descends on even the gloomiest of us with something of the benediction of a fine day. And so it was always fine weather on the polite conductor's bus and his own civility. His conciliatory address and good-humoured bearing infected his passengers. Enlightening their spirits, he lightened his own task. His gaiety was not a wasteful luxury, but a sound investment. That's the end of the excerpt on Saying Please, written by A.G. Gardner, based on a day-to-day -day life experience that the essayist had with a bus conductor when he travelled on a bus that was owned by the Underground Railway Company in England.